Good evening. The internet has always had a fascination with weird video games. Whether it's the surreal charm of a game like LSD Dream Emulator, the ridiculousness of a game like Chex Quest which transforms Doom into a child-friendly serial commercial, or of course the strange and sometimes dark histories behind certain games' developments. For example, the real dead bodies shown in Hong Kong 97 and Half-Life 2. There's even an entire subgenre of creepypastas and internet urban legends centering around weird or creepy stuff in games. The ghost cars of GTA San Andreas, or even stories like Sonic.exe and Ben Drowned. Similarly, there's always been something enchanting about the way people twist otherwise normal video games into something peculiar through modding. What possesses a man to take the pyro from Team Fortress 2 and make him look like this? Why is this supposed map of a guy's house actually a terrifying and elaborate retelling of a postmodern horror novel starring Shrek? The stories behind and told through video game mods can be just as, if not more fascinating than the actual games they come from. And I've spent a lot of time on my channel talking about the peculiar and odd stories that emerge from these niche and obscure cultures. Recently though, I came across an especially weird case from my corner of the internet. A Japanese developer who has built some of the most ridiculous and fascinating game experiences I've ever seen, but whose work seemingly no one else on YouTube has ever taken the time to slow down and explore properly. And frankly, it's a journey that I think might have changed me as a man. So, if you would like, to Today I want to lead you down the same path. Today, I want to tell you about all the strange and otherworldly sights I uncovered while exploring the insane world of Take Depo 50 Cal. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. If you've ever felt like your default browser is boring, look no further than Opera GX. This sleek, highly versatile, and just plain cool web browser is tailor-made for gamers. And its customization has only gotten better with GX Mods. With GX Mods, you can customize every inch of your browser. The sounds that play when you press a key or open and close tabs. What background music you might want to hear. The themes and colors of the browser. Even custom wallpapers. And the best part, if you don't like something, you can simply disable or re-enable it using the mods menu on the sidebar. Visit the GX store and you'll find there's a wide variety of mods for you to explore and create. Opera GX didn't stop at just GX mods though, they've also built in native support for generative AI. If you find yourself using ChatGPT or ChatSonic a lot, Opera GX embeds them in the sidebar, making it much easier to access them if you need help with ideas, planning, or really anything. ChatSonic even allows you to generate images on the fly, right there in your browser. Now switching browsers is usually very painful, but thankfully Opera GX actually has an import tool that lets you quickly bring over all the settings from your previous browser over to Opera GX, like browsing history, bookmarks, cookies, and it's even compatible with every Chrome extension to make your transition as smooth as it can possibly be. On top of that, Opera GX offers the GX Corner, an actively curated hub delivering you updates on free games, good deals, the latest releases, and breaking gaming news, all in one convenient place. Like here, you can see the Silent Hill 2 remake and Black Ops 6 coming out later this month. So if you're looking for an upgrade, break up with your boring browser, head to the link in the description below, and switch to Opera GX today for free. Alright, back to the video. Take Depo 50 Cal is the name of a somewhat infamous modder in the Japanese Half-Life community. Now, Half-Life is a series that's no stranger to modding. In fact, it was in large part developed by people who created mods for the original Quake and Doom, and projects like Crack Life or Cry of Fear have pushed the game in some very interesting directions. But Take Depo is a unique case. For one, just the fact that he's a Japanese Half-Life fan might strike some as a bit peculiar. Given that Half-Life is an American series originally set in America, it's easy to assume it wouldn't have a big audience overseas. But Half-Life does actually have a pretty interesting history with Japanese culture. The original game includes an elevator sequence inspired by the Japanese manga Akira, which was iconic enough to later inspire set pieces in other games like Fallout New Vegas, and there was even a special release version of Half-Life 2 exclusively distributed via Japanese arcade cabinets called Half-Life 2 Survivor, which is honestly a whole can of worms of its own. Anywho, Takedepo's interest in Half-Life might not actually be so weird on its own, but what is weird is the type of mods he makes. In fact, I've been calling him a Half-Life modder, but technically what Takedepo creates matters for is Sven Co-op, a multiplayer fork of Half-Life on Steam that's been around for over a quarter century now. It was around before Half-Life 2, hell, it was around before any of the official 90s Half-Life expansions, so needless to say, there's been plenty of time for it to build a fascinating and weird modding scene. Because it's free on Steam, it also technically allows you to play the Half-Life campaign for free, even if you don't own the original game, which is kind of funny. Now, I imagine the majority of people watching this outside of Japanese Half-Life or Sven Co-op circles won't recognize Takedepo's name, but I promise you he's worth knowing. Rather than give you a lackluster description of his mystical work though, there is no better introduction than simply showing you his most popular map, Pizza Yasan. 
Fair warning before we dig in, I know you guys absolutely loved my Japanese pronunciation in the last video. I'll try to be better about it this time, but I am really, really American. So I would just like to quickly apologize in advance to the Nipponese community for the linguistic atrocities I may be about to commit. PTSN originally released in 2016 and made waves in a certain few niche online communities, but I don't think it really got the appreciation it deserved, to be honest. It opens in what I guess is supposed to be some kind of Super Mario Bros. themed hospital. Then once all the players are connected and ready, we press this button to start the mission, and from there the story of PTSN officially begins. A cutscene opens and we're shown a very busy building labeled the Uboa Pizza Shop, presumably somewhere in Japan. A newspaper posted outside called the Uboa Newspaper suggests Uboa to be the town name. For the rest of this mission, we will be playing as valued employees of this small town pizza shop. We then get introduced to our boss, an ASCII art-faced gentleman with 303,000 health and a machine gun. Pretty standard as far as pizza shop owners go. Looking in the files, his real name seems to be Shin, but in-game he's simply labeled as Pizza Shop Owner. From what I can tell, the map named PTSN roughly translates to Mr. Pizza Store or Pizza Store Owner, so technically this guy would be the PTS on in question. Anyways, Shin tells us that the shop is a mess filled with litter and tasks us with cleaning it up. From here we're given two weapons, the pizza and the pizza cutter. The pizza cutter is a reskin of the crowbar that we will be later using as a deadly weapon, while the pizza is a reskin of the Sven co-op med kit that's used to heal your teammates. Around the pizza store we can actually come across a few friendly NPCs serving as our fellow employees, namely these two little guys named Leader and Chief. Leader is the one with the desert eagle, while Chief is the one with the shotgun and the backwards hat, and frankly, they're both absolutely adorable. Hopefully this video inspires people to make more fan art of the two. There's also an unnamed employee of the Oboa Pizza Shop who handles the front reception, but he doesn't seem to be as much fun as the other two. Anyways, in order to get our boss to shut up, we've got to go through the building and collect 15 littered items, including a nuke, a skull, a bone, a shotgun shell, a missile on the toilet, and a giant hatched egg. After everything's picked up, the customers are finally allowed to come in. There's this old man who eats a whole pizza pizza by unhinging his jaw like a snake, a cat person who sits down in the pizza shop just to eat his own tray of McDonald's instead, a suited gentleman who prefers to eat his pizza with a pair of chopsticks, and finally there's some kind of weird anime cat girl thing. The townspeople of Uboa sure are an interesting bunch. Anyways, once the store has been open for a short while, the plot finally starts moving as we get a cutscene starring our boss Shen, answering a phone call from some kind of pink cat person referred to in the game files as she. I want to eat pizza. Well, let's get pizza delivered. I'll order delivering extraordinary pizza, yeah. Thank you for calling. How can I help you? Yes, sure. Could you wait for that? This is when the mission actually begins. This pizza delivery that she just requested will be the prime objective of the rest of the PTS on campaign. But first we'll need a pizza to deliver. And to make that pizza, we're going to need some ingredients. So our boss Shin tasks us with getting flour for the pizza dough. Obviously to do this, we're going to need a Glock. It behaves exactly like the one from Half-Life 1, but with a new flashy draw animation you can stim with. We're sent down into a new opening in the store leading to the basement. We head past the suspiciously labeled cheese storage room toward the flour supply, only to find that it's been contaminated by a bunch of harmful insects. As Uboa Pizza Store employees, we must dispatch these harmful insects, which are absolutely not renamed aliens from Half-Life 1 and Half-Life Opposing Force. We clean them up pretty good, but unfortunately we're still going to have to replace the flour that they contaminated. To do this, we of course leave the building and head over to the Uboa Pizza Store's dedicated wheat fields across the street, working together to painstakingly harvest every single stalk and then process it all in an industrial machine. Next up, we're gonna need the cheese. Heading back into the basement, we quickly learn why there's some warning employees not to leave the door open on the cheese storage. The cheese down here is so smelly, it actually produces a deadly gas that has the potential to instantly explode a fully grown man with a single whiff. <laughs> Basically, you have to evade disappearing and reappearing clouds of gas that insta-kill you. It's very ridiculous and also took me and my friends a lot longer than it probably should have. Eventually, one person has to stay behind to crank a valve to open a door from behind a shelf, while another heads through it and finally collects the big stinky cheese we're looking for. As a reward, we unlock a shotgun. After the dough and cheese, the pizza's gonna need meat and vegetables. But unfortunately, we learn the meat and veggie shops are apparently being attacked by stray dogs. The quote-unquote dogs are actually hound eye enemies from Half-Life 1 with human 
faces grafted on. Everyone I played with, including me, thought this face was from the Seaman Dreamcast game at first, but it actually isn't. I don't know where the face itself comes from, but this Houndai model is apparently taken from a 2009 Half-Life mod called Scientist Slaughterhouse Mod Mess Up, which was at one point featured in a popular video by the late great Gmod animator Kitty0706 called the Funniest Half-Life Mod. Anyways, once you clear these stray dogs out, we can finally collect meat and veggies from the meat and veggie stores. And that means it's officially time to move on to making the fucking pizza. Back in the Uboa Pizza Shop kitchen, everyone in the server has to work together to push a deadly rolling pin back and forth repeatedly in order to flatten the dough into a base for Shi's pizza. I say deadly because if you touch it wrong, it can and will hurt or maybe even kill you. After doing that for a while, the rest of the ingredients fall on one by one, and things seem to be going very well until, unfortunately, does not work stove. To make work stove, our boss Shin gives us an idea. We all need to throw a fuck ton of grenades into these things on the side of the stove, then go onto the roof and throw more into the chimney. After sufficient grenadage, work does stove, which means we can finally finish the pizza. It's done. It's so beautiful. But before we get the chance to begin the delivery, a scanner outside the building detects something, and the pizza shop owner barks up. We got a situation. The monsters tracking down pizza are incoming. Kill them all. Incoming from the north. Which way is the north? Hint, the direction of the sun. Oh yeah, this way. Security systems activated. <laughs> From here on out, we have to defend the pizza store from a giant horde of pizza eaters, which looks suspiciously similar to the harmful insects and stray dogs from earlier. It's here we get our hands on this laser drone strike weapon, which is so janky it gave me flashbacks to the detonator from Fallout New Vegas Lonesome Road, as well as a peculiar green sniper rifle that can be found mounted on the roof of the pizza shop. The rifle is meant to be made out of bamboo, as a reference to the map creator's username. Takadepo 50 cal translates to 50 cal bamboo gun, and that's what's supposed to be seen both here in the map and in the hands of the cool military guy in Takedepo's profile picture. You can use the Takedepo as a mounted gun and fire down at enemies from the roof of the pizza store. The final boss of Pizza Yasan Episode 1 comes in the form of a monster named Voltichan. Players must kill it or call reinforcement endlessly. Voltichan at first glance appears to be just another Voltigore from Half-Life Opposing Force, but if you look close you can see he's actually got a little bib and a set of cutlery in place of his claws. It's honestly kind of cute, but since he wants to come eat this pizza that's not his, we're going to have to put him down. Unfortunately, the Takedepo was not super useful against Voltichan because it's just not at a very good angle, but the best strategy I've found is to get him stuck near the wheat field and just take turns with your teammates air striking the shit out of him. Once the boss is defeated, our actual boss starts barking at us again. The enemies were exterminated. Prepare for delivery. Maybe. The road has many turns. But never say never. Then, after a fade to white, we cut to our customer back in his apartment. <laughs> I can't wait for pizza. To be continued. The first episode of Pizza Yasan manages to be pretty memorable despite mostly being straightforward Half-Life gameplay, but the second and final part is where things get a little more creative and puzzling. Pizza Yasan 2 opens in a Super Mario hospital just like the first episode, but this time it's decorated with posters of a Japanese security company called Zcom and a floating drone. Both these things will turn out to be very important later on. Once all players are ready, we start the mission and Pizza Yasan delivery part begins. Hey! Delivery the pizza! Stop playing Gwent! Hey, you did cheat! Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm gonna carry the pizza. Sure thing, sir. By the way, where is customer's home? We have no choice than to visit at random. Well, guide me. The majority of this episode centers around this grappling hook item, a reskin of the barnacle gun that appeared in Half-Life Opposing Force. We have a rough idea of where the pizza should be delivered to, but not a direct address. So we have to traverse this urban parkour course and use the grappling hook to pull Shin around. That way we can check various addresses and see if we can find the residence of whoever ordered this big ass pizza on his head. This involves a lot of climbing, attaching to other players to save time or alternatively just to mess with each other, and platforming on top of drones like the one seen in the spawn room. There's also a slightly ominous sign warning us about dangerous crows in the area. This apartment block has a lot of addresses to check, which normally wouldn't be a big deal, but because this is apparently a very bad neighborhood, behind every door are waves of wrong customers eager to steal a pizza that's not rightfully theirs, leaving us no choice but to fucking kill them. After checking every house in the area with no luck, we get a cutscene. Where is customer's home? I don't know. We have no choice but to try that way. For now, head to observation tower. Wait, what the? 
Our pizza crew are ambushed by a pack of urban crows, which are actually Stuka bats from the Half-Life 1 Alpha, and more weird hound eye face dogs. After we repelled crows and starey dogs, we make our way up to this big observation tower building as our customer grows increasingly impatient. Is the pizza coming? Once we reach the observation tower as our boss commanded, we're faced with a new obstacle. Wind is very strong. How do we get move? This is risky a bit, but there is only way to use jetpack. In the second stage of PT Assign Episode 2, we're given a fully automatic Glock jetpack gun thing that we have to use to maneuver through the harsh city skies. Thankfully, the map is kind enough to explain how this weapon works with a tutorial on the wall. Right-click to boost upwards with the jetpack, left-click to shoot is the gist. You can also increase boost level, but I didn't find it very useful. Once again, we need to use the grappling hook to bring Shin to the end of another obstacle course, but this time it's a lot trickier because there are strong winds swirling throughout the skies, represented by giant solid blocks that insta-kill you and reset Shin back to the observation tower. You basically have to use the jetpack to fly on top of a floating drone platform, bring Shin with you to the same spot with the grappling hook while making sure he doesn't get hit by the wind, then fly on to the next drone, rinse and repeat. Halfway through, we carelessly use C4 to blow a giant hole in the wall of a building to pass through it, and the people inside are understandably startled and concerned. What the fuck? He's terrorist? Oh my god, who reimbursed this? Once we bring Shin to the end of this stage, the customer starts whining again with no consideration for the fact they live in such an inhospitable part of town. The delivery man is slow in coming. Is there? I don't know. Okay, I'll go there. Rather than that, cover me, the both of you. Certainly. From here, we enter the third and final stage of PTS on episode two. In a primitive cityscape with our customer Shi's apartment finally in sight, we're challenged by a bunch of pizza eaters and a laser security system blocking our access. The laser security system is powered by the Zcom company shown in the spawn building at the start. We sneak in through a side door to the apartment building, but the power control room to disable the security lasers is inaccessible because of some kind of web left by an army of enemy caterpillars. In between fighting hostile Roombas and security robots, we have to locate this batch of bug bomb, bring it to an area labeled the pump room, dump the bug bomb into a tank, and hit a nearby switch. This showers the building in some kind of pesticide, gasses the caterpillars to death, and clears our path to the power room. We hit this big switch and disable the main security system, and can now finally enter Shi's apartment building. There's still a bunch of fucking security robots everywhere though. I realize there are a bunch of pizza thieves in this area, so it makes sense to have a security system, but Jesus Christ, this is a little excessive. Once we reach the top floor, we see a handwritten note from Shi. Dear pizza delivery man, Bring a pizza to my room, please. We enter Shi's apartment, but unfortunately the final layer of security that exists just to protect their bedroom kicks online. There's a server room across the hall with a security switch and a computer browsing some kind of Sven co-op form, but unfortunately disabling the switch does nothing. The game then not so subtly tells us to commit more acts of terrorism. The text, now it must be done by force, flashes on screen, alongside a shot of a Zcom tower. From here, a bunch of security helicopters get deployed all over the map, and in order to continue, we have to kill them all and destroy the Zcom server systems, which are located in a few towers scattered across the map. Some of these servers are also kept underwater for some reason. I guess they must run pretty hot. By this point, it's been so long since the pizza delivery order was placed that she is getting seriously impatient. I'm hungry. I've half a mind to eat noodle. Once the servers are all destroyed, it's time for the final boss of PTSR, a giant Zcom hyper security robot. It's basically a reskin of an island from Half-Life 1. Amidst all the chaos and helicopters, there's a bunch of power generators around the map healing him that you have to destroy to take him down. Once they're all taken care of and the hyper security robot is destroyed, the security system to Shi's bedroom turns off, and we can finally pull Shin through the apartment to deliver this pizza once and for all. Yeah, tastes so good. Hey, would you like one piece? Thank you, sir, but we'll have to decline. We've got work to do. I see. Good luck with your work. Thank you, sir. Please order again. Hey, let's go back. Yes, sir. The order of the pizza has been completed, but it's not all over. We need to prepare for the next order, because shop is very busy anytime. We cut back to the Uboa Pizza Shop as the lone receptionist answers a phone call. Thank you for calling. Yes. Yes, uh, certainly. Thank you, sir. Oh my god! Received an order for the special pizza again.
The end. Pizza san ends on a cliffhanger ending, insinuating that this journey of destroying buildings, flying through the air on drones and jetpacks, and massacring hordes of zombified customers is just one of countless ridiculous tales from the Uboa Pizza Shop delivery crew. It's surprising just how much kinship you feel with these weirdo text art creatures by the time you finish the series. My friends and I felt an actual sense of triumph and peace finally handing the pizza over to Shi. You practically feel like a band of superheroes by the end of it all. It's a little weird that a random security company and pack of caterpillars become the main antagonist out of nowhere toward the end, but PTSI is still unironically a very creative and charming two hours of Half-Life gameplay that managed to keep me and my friends glued to our seats the whole way through. What's insane, though, is that pretty much all of Take Depo 50 Cal's maps push the boundaries of Half-Life modding just as far or even further than PTSI, and the rabbit hole of his work goes a lot further than I realized when I first played this map all those years ago. You might have been wondering as we went through PTSI, how did Take Depo come up with any of this shit? Where do these weird characters come from? What the hell is Boa. Well, I did some digging and managed to figure most of it out, I think. First of all, the cute characters in this map seem to be based on cat ASCII art that emerged from Japanese image boards in the late 90s and early 2000s. I was able to find a webpage with a whole collection of amateurish RPG games and ROM hacks focused around characters like these, the most popular being named Mona. But alongside Mona was also another cat character named She, who before his glamorous cameo in Pizza san seems to have actually been some kind of board mascot on 2chan. We can also see in the beginning of Pizza san a shout-out dedicated to the Game Saba community members. After a quick search, I found Game Saba to be an online Japanese fan co op community dating back to the early 2010s that Take Depo was a part of. The customers we see throughout the level seem to have been references to Take Depo's friends and fellow mappers in the Game Saba community. The TFC civilian who eats his pizza with chopsticks seems to represent a mapper named Electro. The anime cat girl, a mapper named Nekomata. The burger eating cat guy, meanwhile, is meant to represent the original founder of the Game Saba community. Leader and Chief have lore as well. If we look at their model names, we can see they're labeled as Take and Enyuze. Take is short for Takedepo. It's the map creator's own cute self-insert character. Looking at Takedepo's website, we can see he used to sign his posts with the same ASCII emoticon on the model's face. And there's even an image of the same character in non-pizza work attire with the 50 cal bamboo gun on his back. But who is Enyuze, the chief character with the N on his forehead? For my digging, Enyuze was not only one of Takedepo's mapper friends, but also a big helping hand and inspiration for his work. A lot of the kooky characters and boundary-pushing shenanigans from Takedepo's maps seem to have evolved from Enyuze's work. And he seems to have been the godfather of this genre of wacky, high-octane ASCII art Japanese levels that the broader Sven Co-op community have dubbed Uboa maps. I can't tell you with any confidence what Uboa is or what it means, unfortunately. The first thing my mind shot to when looking into it was the freaky secret monster of the same name in Yumi Nikki. But from what I can tell, it doesn't actually seem to be related at all. What I can tell you is what Uboa isn't, at least according to this graph on Enyuze's profile. According to Enyuze, Uboa is not the maps. It's not the ASCII art, it's not the models used in the maps, and it's not the monsters and NPCs in them either. I guess it's just this one particular face. This is the Uboa face. And I guess that means that the people who consider all of Take Depo's maps to be Uboa maps are wrong, since some don't feature it. But looking around on YouTube at this point, I think the name is stuck. Speaking of Take Depo's maps, there's a lot more of them than just PTSI, san and I went through and played all of them for this video. Well, all except the one there's no English translation for. The earliest one I could find is called Otokotati no Kozan, or The Men's Mine. This map was originally released on June 12, 2009, and I could only imagine it was inspired by the Minecraft rage going on around that same time. Basically, you and your friends get sent down on a mining expedition, clearing out chunks of rock with a pickaxe, before later on obtaining a sledgehammer and dynamite sticks. Along the way, you'll need to activate lamps to light your way through the map, parkour through some real bullshit areas, and kill hound eyes and gnomes. The map ends with a final boss sequence, except the final boss is actually just a big-ass wall with a ton of health, that you have to bust down while enduring attacks from a never-ending horde of high-level enemies. The ending isn't anything special, and the map only took about 40 minutes to beat, but it was still pretty fun for what it was. After that came Hidoi Map on May 12, 2010. Hidoi meaning cruel or harsh. Cruel and harsh this map is indeed. Me and my friends managed to eventually beat it, but I'm not entirely sure if we did it in the intended way. After dealing with bridges that you sometimes fall right through with no rhyme or reason, as well as a series of bizarre jumping puzzles, and an eagle room that gives you a desert eagle and demands you use its laser sight as a cane to traverse a bunch of invisible platforms, we finally got stuck here. The obvious path seemed to be this big metal block, but every time we tried to jump on it, we just fell right through it. After about 20 minutes, I finally caved and looked up a walkthrough. What? Wait. What? It's water. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> It only gets more stupid from there, jumping into paintings Mario 64 style to participate in quote-unquote sumo wrestling, dealing with blast doors that are actually movable objects, and a whole host of other bullshit. What the fuck? No, that's elevator? No, that's good. <laughs>
What? Now this is the elevator. What the fuck? Now surely this is a normal gondola that is with no tricks. Surely. Surely. I'll press the button. Oh fuck oh. you! <laughs> That's fucking, fucking ridiculous. Why, why, why did you stand on the end and I press the button? Unless it does something different. Oh no! It, it does something that. different. How many? Surely it only has two fucking things programmed for this. You're wrong. No, okay, no, now it's the wires. After holding off hordes of ninjas with nothing but a folding chair, solving an elaborate Jenga tower puzzle, evading waters full of annoying screaming Barney sharks, traversing what I could only describe as reverse death run courses, and doing a bunch of laps on a race course evading speeding cars, the final scene of Hidoi Map sees us placed into a game Saba Coliseum and defending a giant black version of Domo from an army of Super Mario military soldiers. These Mario soldiers share their likeness and name with the spawn hospital seen at the start of Pizza San, Yas. I can't tell you what Yas itself stands for, but from the notes stapled to their backs, the soldiers seem to be a representation of asshole players who don't like Takadepo's maps. To take them all down, you'll be aided by a cat girl named Miketama and the chopstick pizza eater Electro, six years before his appearance in Pizza San. If you pay close attention, you'll notice his attack is him firing magical green beams out of the wrong end of two desert eagles. There's a couple of other early seeds of Pizza San and Hidoi map as well, by the way. There's a house dedicated to Shi, a wanted poster for Nekomata, and even a photo of Shi standing in a field with Takadepo's character outside his pizza uniform. The level ends very abruptly after the Yas boss fight and is definitely not Takedepo's most polished work, but it was still pretty satisfying to complete given how challenging it was at times. One of the best deep cuts in Takedepo's catalog though is Daikon Warfare, an intense two-hour action movie experience from August 2010 about turnips. It also seems to be Takadepo's earliest work to include narrative cutscenes with actual character dialogue. Starting out in a small humble village named Daikon that exports turnips under the command of the village chief, who happens to be the original incarnation of the jaw-unhinging man in P.T. Yasan, we have to first defend our crops from who else but harmful insects. A nice young man with a minigun comes to help us out eventually, as does a very unfortunate looking dog. Around the map there's various boxes that you can find and blow open to save cats trapped inside. Doing so will cause the cat girl Miketama from the Hidoi map to show up and fight alongside you. As our village chief prepares to send off a shipment of radishes, a conniving band of radish thieves intercept it. These radishes are ours. Hum, I don't let you do that. Defeat thieves. The rest of the campaign is spent dealing with these radish thieves, putting down all the stragglers raiding our village and later chasing the leader down the highway in a high-speed vehicle chase. Fuck them at all. I'll corner and beat them. They must be past this way. We will catch up them soon. I see. Speed up. Never underestimate radish farmers. Several suspicious cars are seen. Apparently, they seem to want to fight us. Just fine. We will defeat them all. After killing countless turnip thieves and destroying their trucks, vans, and helicopters in a long and genuinely quite thrilling combat sequence, we finally chase the turnip thieves back to their shady headquarters. Did you obtain radishes? Yes, sir. But they seem to never give up. They are likely to come here soon. Well, prepare the chopper. It must be here. Well, attack simultaneously. We push through the Turnip Thief HQ, slaughtering countless Turnip Thief guards, and even catching glimpses of their questionable web history. After a fight with a giant mech and a platoon of Radish Thief executive ninjas, we make our way to the roof of the building to confront the leader and president of the Radish Thieves organization once and for all. Now, if we don't blow up his helicopter before three minutes is up, the mission will fail and we'll get a bad ending where he escapes. So we have to focus all of our grenades and rockets toward the helicopter, instead of the enemy troops pouring in, to make sure that we destroy it in time. I never give radishes. I do so if I lose radishes. Ah! Shit! Our radishes! But I never mind about radishes. What? I think we only have to make radishes again. However, why have we fought up to now? Haha, <laughs> we could prove, isn't it? The soul of farmers is! We must be the best farmer in world. Best in world. I see. Finally, I was. Well, I have no time to stay here. Yes, you are right. Let's return to village immediately. Next time, let's make the best radishes in the world. I guess the young man who tagged along with us didn't realize that these radishes weren't actually that important to this farmer. He just wanted to take down these thieves for the fun of it, I guess. But as text on screen tells us, their fight still continues. The true fight called making best radishes in the world. And with that, Daikon Warfare comes to a close. It's probably my second favorite map of Takadepo's, behind only Pizza Yasan. One of the deeper cuts is half life a row which depicts a serene spa resort with no real combat or objective. It's basically just a hub world with a bunch of secrets and weird areas for 
players to explore together. From what I can tell, this map is actually Takedepo's renovation of another mapper's work from almost 10 years prior, but I unfortunately couldn't find the original version anywhere online. The spa resort has mini games you can play by pressing E on computers and arcade cabinets laying around. The male saunas have very hilarious looking naked scientists and Barneys hanging out in them, as well as a skeleton in the locker room. And the female saunas also have their own set of provocative characters. The most strange and interesting thing I could find on this map is this barnacle gun on the sauna's roof. If you look up in the sky from here, there's actually this platform you can use the barnacle to pull yourself towards. From there you can find a secret portal taking you to a giant room full of anime girl portraits, and get your hands on an anime girl figurine weapon that shoots lasers. I wish I could tell you what any of the stuff in this map means, but I suspect it's a secret that Takedepo and Nekomata will take to their graves. After the brief success of Pizza san in 2016, Takedepo earned a mention in a Rock Paper Shotgun article for his work on Boa Rampage 1 and 2, which are a duo of maps that transforms Fen Co-op into an all-out beat-em-up brawler game, complete with some really fucking cool in-game title sequences. Everyone on the server assumes the role of these weird Uboa beanbag things, just like Shin from Pizza San. The Rock Paper Shotgun article calls them soda cans, like Master Shake, I guess, but I have no idea if that's what they're actually supposed to be. The gameplay consists of fighting off hordes of enemies throughout various stages, picking up scattered weapons off the ground and switching them out when they break, slowly filling up your rage meter to occasionally carry out these big, powerful speed attacks. Different Different stages have different enemies. You'll come across these freaky Uboa men, more caterpillars and barney sharks, these giant green devil things named Mr. Kimo men, Konichiwa men, and more Maki men, which from what I can tell are more black domos like we saw in Hidoi map. Each stage also ends with its own boss, usually a bigger form of whatever enemy you just held off, giant caterpillars and such. The final antagonist of the first Uboa rampage is an Uze. After a boss rush on this big tower of his, we face off against him in some kind of weird spiritual hell realm where he takes on the form of a giant cat spider testicle thing. Once you beat him, you get to carefully place a piece of poop on his head as a humiliation, and then all of our heroes hang out in a hot spring to enjoy peace after their victory. Uboa Rampage 2 is mostly more of the same, but it adds in a bunch of new enemies and weapons, as well as this elaborate class system. It's basically a more polished, dynamic, and in my opinion fun version of the original Uboa Rampage. It even lets you get these cool Wolverine claws. The final boss of Uboa Rampage 2 turns out to be none other than Electro from Pizza San and Hidoi Map, this time taking on the role of an electric kung fu master with an out outrageous amount of health. You can't actually kill Electro, but once you smack him around for long enough, he gives up and apologizes to everybody by holding a drinking party. And with that, the Uboa Rampage series comes to a close. These maps are yet another example of Takedepo's wonderful creativity and twisting Half-Life into something it absolutely is not, but if you're gonna try this out, I recommend getting together as many friends as you possibly can. These levels can really drag on if you're playing with any less than four people, especially the first one. By 2019, Takedepo had officially been creating Sven co-op maps for over a decade, and then October of that year, he released one of his strangest works yet. Bear with me, Resia no Tabi, or Train Travel. And somehow it's strange in a completely different way from all the others. In Resia no Tabi, combat takes a back seat as players are led on a very comfy trip through rural Japan, boarding this nice sleeper train and traveling from stage to stage with their pals. It is just about the furthest thing from conventional Half-Life action you could come up with, but somehow still manages to be quaint and enjoyable. In between stages, you can explore the train, take showers, drink sake, shoot dice, throw baseballs, and generally dick around while waiting on the next stop. I noticed that Anuze can be spotted as the mayor of Uboa, suspected of tax evasion on a newspaper in a table booth. From what I can tell, the objective of the map is basically just to visit a bunch of different stages representing different areas of Japan. And at the end of each stage, you get a social media score based on your behavior. You gain upvotes by just being nice and taking pictures of cool stuff with your phone camera, and you get downvotes by beating up random citizens or otherwise disrespecting Japan in heinous ways. The first stage is simply referred to as Old Town, where you interact with shopkeepers, examine and ninja stars and look through binoculars at distant sites until suddenly troublesome customers come and you have to help briefly defend the town. The second stage is the castle, which is basically a short little parkour course, but if you get to the top you get a nice view to take pictures of for points. The third stage is called the Pond of Guardian Fish. You have to help clean up the pond by diving into the water and moving trash bags and other litter to the surface trash can. Afterwards, a big friendly shark will spawn and everyone gets to sit around and admire it. The fourth stage is a spot where we practice pottery by learning how to build pots out of clay, but it's pretty boring. I found it to be probably the least enjoyable part of the map. The penultimate stage is a large, famous temple marked by a giant Buddha statue, but if you solve this weird torch puzzle, you can actually get on Buddha's good side, and in turn he'll help you out in the finale. Everything culminates in a visit to a dignified shrine to donate money as an offering and pay our respects to Japan. But a bunch of evil ninja guys show up to try and steal money from the temple, so we have to kill them with Buddha's help. Then it's back to the sleeper train one last time. By the way, I actually found an easter egg on here. If you bust out this window and climb onto the roof of the train, you can find yet another Take Depot. 
It's quite funny that in spite of all the ridiculous things that happen in Resia no Tabi, it's actually still probably the least eventful map in Takedepo's entire catalog. At the time of me making this video, Takedepo's latest map is Kanai Gyosen from less than four years ago, which translates to Crab Fishing Boat. The map takes place on a ship at sea, as you could expect, complete with sleeping quarters and a deck and everything. The events of the level take place over the course of a week, with the objective being to capture a bunch of head crabs from the bottom of the sea and take them up to a cage on the ship using a harpoon. You can also use the same grappling hook from Pizza Yasan to get around faster underwater, and it's yet another very weird twist on the Half-Life formula. There's a bunch of other really strange stuff going on in Kane Gyosen as well. It has a machine gun that actually marks the first time I've ever seen someone make a weapon in Sven Co-op with Call of Duty-style iron sights. There's smaller boats you can cruise around in with your friends, which is quite a lot of fun. That is, until you get knocked off by a giant wave. And eventually whales, hostile sharks, and even pirates on other boats and in helicopters show up to challenge your crab expedition, giving you a real use for that machine gun. Unfortunately though, the ending of Kanai Gyosen isn't any more special than that of a GTA Online heist. It just shows your team returning to shore and selling their crabs for a lot of money. Still though, it was actually a lot more fun and impressive than I was expecting, and really shows how far Takedepo has come in his Sven co-op mapping journey since 2009. So, after dissecting all of that, what the hell did I learn from diving deep into the rabbit hole of Take Depo 50 Cal? Well, I learned to appreciate a specific bygone culture completely foreign to me, and I learned about a great Herculean effort from one eccentric man who has spent hundreds of hours building an obscure Half-Life map catalog for over a decade and a half now. I enjoyed a number of silly, surreal, and fun experiences packed with good music, and frankly the entire thing brought me to a feeling of childish bewilderment. And things like that are priceless. I know I kind of poked fun at the poor English in some of these levels, but I don't want anyone to get it twisted. I absolutely loved playing through each and every one of Takadepo's works, and the last thing I want is for people to think I'm making fun of the author. There's so much value added to the world with stuff like this crossing the seas of culture via the internet, and in my opinion, the poor English actually added a lot to the entertainment factor and charm. Takadepo clearly knows his audience. These maps aren't always the most complicated or well-designed, but they're perfect to just boot up and play with some friends and spend co-op for an eccentric and fun time. It shows so much care that pretty much every map in Takadepo's catalog has its own custom weapons and health kit models. He's provided such an interesting and great variety of mods, and I unironically now view him as one of the most inventive and creative video game modders of our time. It's a great thing that he took the effort to translate his work into English so more people could enjoy it. I tried to reach out to Takedepo 50 cal when I first started work on this video, but he politely declined to comment. Looking back though, I'm actually glad that he did. It was much more rewarding to try and uncover all the lore about Game Saba and stuff myself by digging through old YouTube comments and old Steam discussion posts, instead of just hearing it in an easy way directly from the horse's mouth. I'm pretty sure this video is going to reach Japanese Sven co-op players or maybe Takedepo himself eventually. To them specifically, I want to say, if it turns out I missed something or if I misrepresented something, I'm truly sorry. I really tried the best I could with my limited understanding of these communities and cultures. As this video comes to a close, the most important message I want to leave you with is to always be nice to food service workers. You have no idea what the hell else they might have going on. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, subscribe for more, and have a good day. Thank you.